Hello, Mr. Jason. Oh, Mr. Craig, Mr. C Wait, we didn't do the ding ding. Here, here. Ding ding. It there seems like you don't even have your ear horn in. You're acting so crazy. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you heard me. Who do we have coming at us hot? Ooh, we got Mikey Taylor, pro skater that ollies into a private equity real estate investment firm. And if you like St. Archer beer, he started that too. Well, what the heck? Let's do this. Let's drink that down. Buckle up. It's the Insurance Dudes Podcast. Why don't we just go through your background just a little bit to set some context here today? <laughs> and, oh, and welcome you to the insurance dudes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, famous. Yeah. So my <laughs> background uh, started in skateboarding. Uh, I was awesome. a pro skateboarder for about 15 years. Um, I kind of had picked a path that uh, was a passion, but uh, it inevitably was going to end. So I had to figure out how I could... Uh, either retire or reinvent myself, you know, sometime in my early thirties. Uh, that path began with starting my own companies. Uh, one of those companies was a craft brewery, uh, that we started in San Diego called St. Archer. Uh, and then the newest company that I started and now we're currently building is a private equity fund called Commune Capital. Wow. I love it. Love yeah. it. I worked at a, at a bar in, um, in Newport, uh, Boss Cat Kitchen. Do you know yeah. Boss Cat? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. We, Are you guys big... SoCal? Or do you live in California? I'm in SoCal. Yeah. I... And I remember there's a big connection with St. Archer. There and, you go. Uh, yeah. I grew up started. in SoCal and then I moved to Arizona. So I'm in Arizona. I need to get back that way because I miss the ocean. You're close, You're close enough. Yeah. Close. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get out there a lot. Yeah. So it's a you were your pro skateboarder. Yeah, not a normal fifteen path, years. Right? <laughs> yeah, but you know what? How many times? Like you hear it all the time. Everybody, I think more now than ever. It doesn't matter what age you are. You are going to have to reinvent yourself at some yeah. point in time. Yeah. Um. There, there's not this linear path like it was fifty years ago. Yeah, that's right. Well, um, and, and so, there, there yeah. isn't a lot of uh, uh typically ambition tied to skateboarding i remember you know yeah. <laughs> it was decades ago maybe mm -hmm. even hundreds of years ago when i was skateboarding and um you know there wasn't you know there was that almost criminal element attached yes. to being a skater you know in yeah. southern california yeah so, right. um how, maybe. how did you and were you the delinquent that the typical skateboarder is and then how did you get out of that and change uh direction Okay, uh, that's such a good question. Um, I was and wasn't. Um, I wasn't, you know, <laughs> you know, I was a skateboarder. So, like, you know, kind of uh, what we did in a sense is illegal because we're skating on properties that aren't ours, and part right. of our job was constantly running from the cops, right? So, right. Uh, yes, uh, I, you know, it, there is an element to it, but like. Was I a delinquent in the sense of like doing things that were like, uh, what would you say? Uh, anything other than me just riding a skateboard, I was pretty like <laughs> on par with being a good dude. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. It was just the art of skateboarding that I think people mm -hmm. that I I what what I did that there were people that thought it was wrong maybe, uh, but no, but you are right in a sense of skateboarding definitely has a you know, an anti, uh, oh, man, skateboarders like don't like success. It's a, yeah, there is okay. an anti-establishment kind of feel to it. It was like us against the world. So there was a part of me that like was very worried about, uh, wanting to be successful because that was so frowned upon inside of our world. Uh, and so when I came to the point of like, okay, I want to do this. I just like kept it really quiet. I didn't tell anybody. I was like, terrified that i was gonna be like the, <laughs> gonna the, be the whack dude that like wanted to like make money you know? <laughs> yeah well it, well and the the generation before you did did that too with tony and lance mountain and all of those guys ended up you know pivoting out also well not yeah. all, but but a good yeah amount. they pivot they pivoted out but there's a difference between pivoting out and having to like 
do something in a completely different world. Yes. Mm-hmm. And somebody like a Tony pivoting out, but his identity is still based around him yeah. as a skater. Right? right. I think that's the, that is the biggest challenge is when you have to reinvent yourself in a sense of like, I need to find out like a whole new meaning and purpose. Mm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Where when you say your name, not everybody knows. Yeah, exactly. Knows yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, dude, when I like, you know, if I go to some like conference now, it's like no one. I'm not like a pro <laughs> skateboarder. I'm the you yeah. know, same as the guy next to me, having to introduce myself and start at the first floor. So, so that, they're not that like... wait. Exactly. I'm not Don't doing like autograph up. signings at like the lending conference in you know <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so take us through that journey of uh, starting St. Archer was right af- after that, right? Uh, after my career ended? Yeah. No, St. Archer was actually during my career. It, it, oh, cool. Uh, it was, you know, in my eyes, the thing that I was going to build and that I was going to be after skateboarding. It was like my, my retirement thing. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Uh, the thing that happened is we ended up selling it before my career ended. That, that was just, I wasn't planning on that. So it was like, you know, there was a part of it that was like amazing, but frightening at the same time, because now I had to figure out what I was going to do all over again, you yeah. know, but it was originally like, you know, uh, my wife had a conversation with me one day and she was like, Hey, look, uh, I think you should start thinking about what the next thing that you're actually going to do is like, I know you're like, you know, I, I was always really good with money, but like, what was going to be like my driving factor to like wake up every day. She's like, I, I want you to start thinking of that. And, <laughs> and so she planted that idea and then that turned into me wanting to start all these companies. It was just like, you know, kind of random timing that my friend Josh and I were filming this video and this idea came up for us to do a brewery. And this conversation I had with my wife a week prior, it was like, okay, this is my thing. This is my identity. Let's this is go it. build this. Cool. How long, how long were you doing that before, before it really started taking off? So it took us about, uh, I would say a year from the idea till actually going out and we had to raise money for it. Mm-hmm. So probably a year till that point uh, of us having business plan and everything. And then probably another six months until we opened doors. So a year and a half from concept to, uh, uh, open for business. That's cool. And it really took off. It took off. It took <laughs> off. It was one of those things, man. It, it, uh, it, it was from the second we opened doors. It was just, we all recognized that we had something special that happened. Uh, it, it, it was just wild. It was such a crazy experience, really. What year That's was cool. that? Uh, we opened, uh, 2012. Okay. 2000. Gosh. It was April of two, no, it might have been 2011. April 2011. So in, in like the heyday of of craft beer and and this this it yeah, it's right when uh, San Diego started like contending as like the mecca of craft beer. But it was like when you started seeing like you know a bunch of people start bringing craft beers to parties. It wasn't just like Corona's and Coors Lights anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it started hitting the mainstream essentially is kind of right when we got in. That's awesome. And then, and then when did you end up selling? Uh, we sold in 2015, October, November, 2015. That's and cool. then I ended up, I, I still was able to skate for a year and a half. So that was like the, you know, what I thought was like, like golden time or, go, you know, the, 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 what would you call it? the credits <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it was uh you know it it was a different experience than i thought it was going to be i guess to say <laughs> so then so then talk about uh community capital like how did that i mean talk about that's what seems like a totally another left turn so u-turn different. i know so <laughs> i'm a big believer of like if you do something once uh, the next thing should be something totally different because, you know, <laughs> getting struck by lightning twice is harder than making it, it happen, uh, in a whole different industry. So, uh, I'm a big believer of like, okay, let's pivot and try something totally new. Um, so 
oh, man, God, where do I even start with this? So basically I, my career ended, right? And I spent all this time trying to put myself in like a safe position when my career was going to basically no longer be there. Uh, I didn't prepare at all for the emotional side. Uh, and so when it happened, the next six months were, uh, God, me just feeling like I wasn't myself, I guess. I felt like I had just lost everything, even though like from a financial standpoint, I was the most successful I'd ever been from an emotional standpoint. It was the lowest of my life. I think it just shows that success doesn't mean meaning. Mm. And so I spent the next six months trying to like figure out who I was again and, and trying to ultimately get back to like, you know, being happy. Uh, and that was hard. That was not, I, mean, I shouldn't but, say hard. That was the hardest thing I had probably ever done, maybe aside from raising kids. And it was like, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, originally I was trying to, you know, it, when you, when you don't feel right, you don't totally know why you don't feel right. You just know you don't feel right. And so in the beginning, I was like trying to start a new company that would then become my identity to mask the pain I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And so for six months, it was like sitting in my room or having meetings, trying to come up with this new idea that was going to become who I was. And I do you know, striking out because I wasn't solving the actual core problem. So like, I, you know, there was one company and it's so crazy how it even got there, but I, my shoe company was the company that dropped me and that's what ended up ending my career. And so like my first thought was, okay, fine. Like I'm going to start a shoe company and like, I'm going to kill them with success. It was like this full, like, you know, like Vendetta. back against the, yeah. <laughs> and, and like, dude, I got all the way to the point. We had a business plan done, the deck, I had shoes sampled from China. I'm looking at a shoe going, why the hell am I doing this? Yeah. Like, <laughs> this is not me. And it was really yeah. just the feeling of like, I got to get back to like feeling good again. And it was that realization that like, I realized like I had to find like my actual purpose again and a company wasn't going to do that. And so during that journey of basically trying to climb out of this kind of hole I was in, uh, this idea of commune came and it was, it was random. It was like a fluke phone call from one of my friends that was just checking in on me. And, you know, he was asking how I was doing and I, you know, I, I, it, I wasn't doing good. And I was just really honest with him telling him, you know, about how lost I was and blah, 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 blah. And he goes, Hey dude. So, uh, and he, it's another pro skateboarder for context who's still a pro skateboarder. And he was like, dude, this is cool. Like hearing about this, but like, think about the position you're in. Like I get that. Like you don't know who you are. I get that you don't have purpose, but like you haven't had a job in a year and you have family and kids. And I haven't heard you complain about money once. Like, dude, you're like, that's like, you hit the golden ticket. And I, and, and I kind of like, as he was saying it, I, I kind of hit the relevance of, I, I, I guess, recognize the magnitude of it where, you know, so many skaters are so scared about how they're going to make money after skateboarding that they don't even realize the emotional side that's to come just like I didn't. But at least I didn't have to figure out the financial part. I was thankful to have somebody come into my life to like help give, give me guidance for that. So I think it was just like that phone call. I was like, oh my gosh there's a massive problem of, of athletes that don't prepare for this. If I could create something that kind of helps them learn about finances, gives them an opportunity to invest in, it also helps them prepare emotionally for when that reinvention or, or identity loss happens, I might be able to do some good. And that actually became like my new purpose and like why I was excited to wake up the next day was like, trying to help a world that I understood how painful and scary it was, you know, wondering what was going to be on the other side of our career or our craft. So that's where that idea came from. It was just a random phone call. Well, and it's that's inevitable, so cool. right? Like nobody's going to be able to skate forever. Like that just, you, you just can't. So that's what's so funny. You're right. We all know that, right? But that doesn't mean we take action to solve <laughs> right. that problem. We just know it. Like, it yeah, on. a lot of people, I mean, did think about it when there's something like that, we're scared of happening. A lot of our natural, uh, I would say reaction to that is to pretend it's not going to happen or to spend no thought yeah. worrying about it. You know? So a lot of so skaters, true. like they'll tell you like, yeah, I don't, I know it doesn't last forever. Well, have you prepared at all? No. 
so it's like you know there's there's it's just i guess instilling tools in in these guys to actually plan while their career is moving up as opposed to your career ending and then now figuring out oh my gosh i didn't build anything to help me through this so god (laughs) so i'm doing a lot (laughs) it's 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 so awesome to give back and make a difference and then you know if you make money from doing it too then i mean it's the ultimate um how how have you do you have enough recognition with with the guys that are coming up where they'll talk to you or do you have to still go in create the rapport and and make those connections with them how does that work so i would think they're kind of like yeah it's a good question like a little skeptical so in skateboarding no in skateboarding just because i was i was a pretty big pro for so long yeah. and a lot of people saw my exit and so i i just gained i guess trust with a lot of guys to be able to i don't want to call it mentor but uh be able to be a different opinion or help in some way the other industries is what i've had to uh kind of break into so we have you know it's not just skaters anymore football players golfers uh so you know am i starting at the very first floor as opposed to just some investor or advisor coming in trying to help no i i am able to leverage not only what i did in skateboarding but you know all athletes know that pain point of their career ending and their identity to follow. So I think just me coming from that world, it's been easier to create relationships. I think for athletes, it's just an easier trust, but uh, there's a lot more, uh, there's more gatekeepers when it comes into the other sports. Like with skateboarding, we don't really have agents. So you can call the skater directly. When you start getting into like football or baseball or some of these conventional sports, you got to work through a lot of people before you actually get to the athlete. So it's been, it's harder. It's definitely harder. I'm not going to lie. And that, that story is pretty common. Like my mom was a, was in the junior Olympics and then had a, a fitness company. And then she got to a point where her back, you know, she never thought she thought she, she was going to be able to do back handsprings until she was 90. Like that was her yeah. goal, you know? Yeah. And I, and she, her identity is really tied to, um, to being able to do that stuff and yeah. being very physical. And, um, I mean, even I used to, I used to play music, drums, tour around, and I thought that was it. And then at some point it was like, I did made that transition. And I'll tell you one thing, the darkest moments of my life was in that transition and I didn't have a job and like I just I felt worthless like I felt like this is what I was meant to do I'm not doing it and I don't even like I I I ended up hating it like I ended up hating music you know and it's just it's a very dark so I think it's one of those I think it's a very common theme that whatever like we all have ourselves tied to these identities um growing up and then at some point you're like well, it doesn't have to be just tied to that. Like I can do other stuff and I can yeah. help people. And Yeah. So I think that's yeah, it's really funny cool. to your point. Like, so we have a lot of, uh, one thing I didn't plan for when we first started this company was uh, that other, there were going to be other uh, call it jobs or, or passions that were going to relate to the athlete pain point. Sales guys, I think resonate more than anybody. And I think it all ties into that reinventing yourself. Like, you know, sales guys have to go through a very similar process as athletes. It just is in a different order, right? Where mm-hmm. athletes have to figure it out possibly, you know, early to late twenties, but they have to do it to continue their craft and then ultimately have to do it when it ends. Sales guys have to continue reinventing them, themselves through their whole career. Mm-hmm. And they also share that pain point of like worrying about what you're going to do the next year. Right. So like mm-hmm. for skaters, uh, our future would be based off our contract and our contract usually lasted two to three years. So if we signed a deal, we knew we had three years of let's call it stability, right? A sales guy has a, a similar, uh, call it pain point of they'll have a great year. And then the next year it starts over and they're always in this, like, well, if I don't continue to grind, 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 it all falls apart. Right. So, it, it, that has been an interesting one for us is how many sales guys we have now included in 
call it our investor community uh, that really share a lot of pain points with athletes. That's so, that's so cool. Can we, can we dive a little bit into exactly what the, what the company does and maybe how some people can be a part of it that might be sure that feels a connection with that sure. kind of purpose. So I'll, I'm going to give you just a little bit of context because it will help with the, with the bigger picture. So when I was 19, I told my parents I was going to be a pro skateboarder. Uh, they were terrified. They were not stoked at all. Yeah. Right? And, and back then, like, I mean, do you remember how important college was back then? Yes. It was like, you have to go. So my parents were like, really, really worried. And one thing my dad did, he was like, okay, look, if you're not going to go to college and you're going to skate, I'm going to connect you. It, it, his name was Randy, one of my dad's buddies who managed money and had real estate funds. He was like the financial call it expert. He's like, you're going to, you're going to meet Randy. I'm like, all right, cool. So 19, I meet this guy, Randy. And what was cool about Randy and what he did is when people invested with him, he treated people like they were a general partner and not a limited partner. So there was a mm -hmm. lot of like learning that went in as an investor that doesn't typically happen when you invest in the deals. And what happened to me is I started learning not only financial literacy, but how you can grow wealth just by investing and participating with this guy. And so a big thing that I basically grew up in and recognized how special it was is to create that type of community and then wanted that for my new company. And what's funny enough, this, this guy, Randy, who my dad introduced me to at 19, is my partner in this company. So we follow that same suit where when people invest with us, we want the return to be bigger than just a monetary standpoint. We want people to feel included in our community, to learn if they want to learn. So we spend a lot of time educating, uh, but we also have an opportunity that they get to invest in you that is, uh, is a pretty exciting one. We, we focus on apartment buildings. So we look for uh, something that we can add value to. So we have a project right now we're working on uh, that we bought a foreclosed Sears building. So it's just a dark vacant Sears building with about 23 acres of parking around it. And we're going to scrape it. We're going to build a whole mixed use community. So it'll be retail below, living above, park, retail. Uh, so that's kind of a project that we look for, something that we can repurpose into a uh, uh, a new class and our value really add cool. being building a new yeah so Will there be um, a skate park there'll be a skate park no skate park dude i love skate <laughs> parks but they do not make money man no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. uh the skate parks are going to be for the non-profit i think yeah yeah well uh, well the funds you know as you're creating wealth and all this stuff i mean yeah Add, you know build one but yeah it doesn't seem like that would bring in a lot of money no that's really cool not. did you did you ever think that you'd be a part of like building projects this big that it's like gonna help people and uh no truthfully no i mean i thought i was gonna be a skater and then i'd have my own <laughs> skateboard company <laughs> you know yeah uh no i do honestly like i come home all the time and probably my wife it, it, it thinks it's like funnier than anything because my wife was the one who, I mean, she's incredibly smart, but my wife went to school for business, got her master's in design, started her own design firm, right? She was like the entrepreneur while I wow. thought I was just the skater. And now yeah. I'm doing all these things that she went to school for. And she's like, this is the craziest thing. Like, <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, how are you like in these type? I never would have thought like this would happen. So there's a, there's a that's part so that's cool. pretty cool. And I think the fact that like, you don't expect skaters to be anything beyond skaters makes it even more uh, impressive, not the right word, uh, out of control. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it's cool too. Cause it goes to show, I mean, it's just, the, the, we're so in this, we're coming out of this box of the way yeah. everything used to be. And it's, we uh, see it so much on our podcast and we're trying to get different people so that we can get, see different perspectives um, yeah. for our businesses and for just our lives. And it's so funny. Like there's just this box that everybody, we, like you said, college, you know, yeah. you get this certain job, 
you you work it and then you retire. And like yeah. I, I see it all the time. I see people that are retiring and then they're just like bored. It's like yeah. why retire? Why even retire? Like yeah, retiring for what? what I a think crazy. Retire- I know. I think retirement is actually a pretty fascinating topic because we have this idea that we're told you work really hard until 60, 65, 70, and then you just no longer work. That's like kind of what our like success story is. But like, I actually don't think retirement is a good thing for anyone. Like, I I think like, you know, I think you get to a point where you can't manage as much. So you might kind of take on less responsibility, but like doing things are good. Like making an impact is good. It's like, it, it, it makes us want to get up the next day and win. You know, when you're not doing anything, what's the incentive of of succeeding that day? There is none. You know? So I actually think retirement. Now I think having the option is there's a freedom element to be able to choose that I think is powerful, but you know, uh, everyone I know that has the option still chooses to do something. Right. You know, you got, and because you, even if you, you got to do something, right. What were you saying? Yes. Well, you, yes. you just become dull. Like there's, if you're not sharpening that pencil constantly, then you're eventually just going to become dull, not be yeah. able to do it. And the drive is gone. And in the same way that a married couple, when one of them passes away, the other one, right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You stop working. It's, it's, it just is ends. That's a hundred percent. You're I like, think even <laughs> that's actually a great analogy. Like when when you see one of like when there's an elderly couple and one passes, the next one usually goes really quick after. Because when they have a purpose, if it's like to be there for the other right. person, you, you you're alive. I mean, God, that's like actually one of the great greater analogies. That's such a such a good example of it. Yeah, you. Yeah. It's it's crazy because we have this innate thing that we need to work people think like work is such a negative connotation like working is good it's actually feeding us like it makes us feel whole you can't just not work i I did for a while it was horrible yeah and i think the more powerful (laughs) component is when you enjoy what you're doing that's where it starts getting special right yeah like if you're doing something that you're miserable doing it and you're counting down the days in which you don't have to do anymore (laughs) That's a pretty good indicator that you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> right. right? Yeah. But like when your days are flying by into months and then years, I mean, God, who cares? Like, I'll, you know what I'm saying? The rate I'm going now, like, dude, 60, 70, 80, why not? Yeah. 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 I love it, man. Uh, so as uh, I know we're, we've been talking for a while, tell us what would be the biggest piece of advice that you would give an insurance agent, insurance agents, a lot in the, um, you, you know, investing field or financial industries. What, what would you give uh, as advice from all of your lessons in business and growth for that matter? Change. Okay. Okay. I think there's, uh, okay. There's two components I think that I would touch on. Um, so insurance, uh, so sales, right? Right. Yes. Insurance guys yeah. are in sales That's guys. It. So yep. I think like if you're talking about building a successful sales business, you have to naturally be really good at hearing no a lot. Right. Yep. That's one thing that like I think skating is really good for is, you know, skateboarding is so hard that it just takes so long to actually land the trick. For example, like when I learned how to ollie. Dude, it took me six months of trying to ollie every day until I landed at one time. And then I started learning how to kickflip and all the way to me becoming pro and doing it at my highest level, I still messed up 99% of the time to accomplish it once, right? So like understanding that when things aren't working doesn't mean that, that you're not doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Accepting it as it's just part of the natural process actually changes the way you view hearing no, right? So like, for example, like when I was young, if somebody would have said, if somebody would have told me no four times in a row, I would have taken that as a sign of this isn't meant for me. Right. After skateboarding, now when I hear no, (laughs) all it is is reassuring me that I need to hear a few more no's until I hear a yes. It's just part of my process to succeed. 
So I think yep. just having that understanding of no is okay. It's just part of what it takes uh, is a, is a big element of being able to be comfortable in, in a world that is more no's than yes. Um, yeah. I think from a business standpoint or investing standpoint, the challenge that I see with sales guys is you get used to these, these wins, right? You get used to the feeling of closing a door or basically working, 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 closing a sale and the, the instant gratification that comes from that close. And you get so used to that process that it's hard to switch into the long game and start building something like financial freedom or passive income, because that is basically a delayed gratification and a small return that grows and grows and grows for a better return down the road. So from what I kind of see with sales guys, you almost have to like take yourself out of that like, yes, I want it now, this like flip it mentality and go into like, okay, I'm going to be disciplined and I am not going to see anything and just basically keep grinding, but offset everything to a later date. Uh, that's when you ultimately create something where you don't have to sell so hard. So I think like starting to look at the long game and not the quick hits would yeah. be a big one, you know? That's great. And I get it. I'm not even saying it like, like, uh, uh, as uh, not understanding why we feel that way. It feels good. Like it's like, right. dude, flipping a house is a perfect example, right? Like flipping houses or house flippers are, are very similar to a sales guy, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to work on it for three months. I'm going to flip it. I'm going to get a huge reward. I'm going to have that feeling of like, yes, I maximized re my return, <laughs> but then I have to go in and do it again and do it again and do it again. And the second I stop flipping homes, well, everything goes away. As mm -hmm. opposed to, let's just use apartment buildings, for example. You get into an apartment building and you might only see, let's call it an 8% return as opposed to your 40% return, right? But your asset is gonna be with you for the next 20 years and then you're gonna plug another one online and then another one online. And your 7% then becomes a 10%, then becomes a 14%. And what happens is you get to a place of actually being able to walk away because your assets generate money for you while you're not working. And you have to kind of switch over into that mindset of like, okay, I'm going to build something that I could ultimately walk away from and give up on this, like this huge win to have a longer win, win down the, down the line. If that makes sense. No, that does for sure. That is well, awesome. Is there any one anything else? Uh, we've we've eaten up a lot of your time, and we really appreciate it, Mikey. Yeah. Um, is there anything like one last message that you can think to deliver to this world that sometimes doesn't know how to to shift away from some of the old habits of sales and and innovation? Um, because I mean, look at what you did—massive transformation. Yeah. Oh. That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a question that we could do a whole podcast on. Stop the skaters. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> it really is. Um, gosh, I would say just to your point, man, just because, just because there's one way to do it doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. You've kind of touched on that throughout this podcast. Just because, like, you know, there's a method to close or there's other people that are doing things to succeed doesn't mean that you shouldn't be thinking of a more efficient way to do it or, you know, a more creative way that puts you in some type of strategic advantage. I mean, yeah. for me, for example, like, dude, if I would have followed like the order of how to do things, I would be <laughs> I, not where I'm at now. I wouldn't even be close. I'd right. be working at possibly the skate shop, <laughs> yeah. you know, barely getting by, probably have to move California out of California because I couldn't afford it. It, it, it's just, I think what's happening now, sorry, this is kind of a long winded answer. No, this is great. I think what's happening now is with social media, us as the people are able to see that the message that was given to us from whether you want to call it government or the schooling system or however they tried to lead the masses actually isn't the most efficient way. Right, and right. now we're able to have access to other people basically doing it new and creative ways. So I think it's just, it's being open to accept that like what we've been told might not be the best way and that there's other options that you need to go then do research in to learn and then try. I think a big one is like 
people just don't go out there and test. I think that's a massive one. Right. It's like try new things. And if they don't work, try more new things until yeah. one lands, you know? There's, there's so many ways to learn on the internet, different courses. I mean, you could buy a course on anything now, right? And yeah. I think you, in, in some instances, you may learn more than if you followed the the thing this cognitive dissonance that we have that you yeah. have to go to you have to you know after you finish high school you have to go to college then you have to go to grad school or you have to do all these things it's like well how much does that set you back i mean people don't uh, even look look at that part well what what I mean, you're talking about now when you start talking about this student loan crisis right, yeah, right, right. we have a student loan crisis that doesn't match up to the amount of money you can make from school right 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 so basically kids take out student loans so that they can go to school and then get a job that's going to pay them better to then cancel out their student loan. But that what we're actually seeing is there's not enough jobs out there that are producing enough income to even cancel your debt. And we're talking about student debt that never goes away, right? There's no uh, bankruptcy of student and, debt. So I mean, the government paying for you to go to this thing that goes up above it, inflation. I mean, it's just... Exactly. So to your God. point, I mean, dude, with the amount of information that is accessible to us right now, I don't think anyone has an excuse to not be great anymore. It, it, it's all in front of us, right? Right. So I, I think it's like, you know, there's a question of, you know, it being more challenging to find the specific thing that you want to move into. But if you find that thing, I think you're going to learn more from the internet and then going out and applying the things you learned into real life as opposed to going to school who's teaching you something that's probably out of date by the time you go out and do it four <laughs> years later, you know? Yeah. So true. <laughs> well, how, Mikey, if, um, how can people... <laughs> what are you guys doing on the insurance podcast? How are we bad on school? And... <laughs> <laughs> All good. A little anti-establishment. Uh, so, so how can people find you, um, your website, uh, the, the fund? Where Give us all the stuff. We'll post it in the show notes and we'll make sure that Thank we you. get some traffic over that way. I appreciate that. So if you want to find me, probably the easiest way is on Instagram, just my name, Mikey Taylor. Uh, if you're interested in the company, uh, our Instagram is Commune Capital. Uh, our website is communecapital.com. And you can, from there, you can then uh, get in contact with us if you want basically more in-depth detail of what our investments look like or kind of what it is to be a part of our community. That's awesome. Love it. Thanks so much, man. Uh, yeah, no problem. Taking the time Thank you, today. Mikey. We really yeah. appreciate it. I mean, our, our first pro skateboarder on the That's on the right. cast and, and a yeah. seriously good dude. So thank yep. you. I appreciate yeah. you guys. It's been awesome, man. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, man. Hey, you've got to check out the Insurance Dudes Inner Circle coming soon where you get extended interviews as well as live coffee talks in our private Facebook group. Join the mailing list today at theinsurancedudespodcast.com. Hey, thanks for checking out the Insurance Dudes. Hey, please subscribe. We got some really great stuff coming out.